Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Professor Ken Bamberger. I teach at the law school and I'm on the faculty director of the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies, uh, which runs the program on Israel Studies here on campus. And the Israel Studies program is extremely uh, pleased and proud to join with the Graduate School of Journalism to convene this set of three Friday noon talks covering Israel, conversations with Israeli journalists. For this series, I in particular want to express our thanks to Dean Edward Wasserman of the Graduate School of Journalism for hosting uh, and promoting these events. For this event in particular, I also want to extend my thanks to Donnie Inbar, the director of the Israel Center of the Jewish Community Federation of San Francisco, who has coordinated our speaker's visit throughout the Bay Area. Donnie, where are you? Thanks so much for being such a good partner with us. And thanks as well to the Consulate General of Israel, who also joined with Donnie Inbar in coordinating this broader tour uh, uh, of our guest today. I want to make note of a couple of spring upcoming events. Uh, first is the third of these three conversations with Janine Zaharia, Friday, March 7th at noon. Janine is the former Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Washington Post and in good parallelism, the former Washington Bureau Chief of the Jerusalem Post and is now a visiting lecturer at Stanford University. Second, I want to call to your attention on Thursday, March 6th, uh, a day-long program on Israeli startups in the international arena to be held at the law school, and material is in the back. And finally, a very special event, uh, a day-long conference, an international conference called Israeli and Palestinian Waterways, History, Politics, and Technology of Water and Environment in the Middle East, where scholars, uh, Israeli scholars, Palestinian scholars, American scholars will all come together to talk about water, the environment, those key critical issues, how they play out in the history and politics uh, of, the, of the region. So please do, before you leave, take one of these flyers. Uh, I, have, I hope that you'll be able to join us. And now to today's events. The mind behind this series is Joan Beter, the Associate Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism and also uh, a member of the Faculty Committee of the Israel Studies Program. Joan was a television news producer at ABC Network News in New York for a decade and taught at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism for 10 years. She joined the Berkeley faculty in 1990, where she teaches reporting and producing courses for television news. Her time spending 10 summers in Singapore led to a book, History of the Jews of Singapore. And she re recently taught a cross-platform travel course at the journalism school, reporting on Palestine and Israel. Joan, thank you for hosting us. Thank you. And Joan will engage in dialogue with our very special guest, Aluf Ben. Aluf Ben is the editor-in-chief of Haaretz, Israel's elite and oldest newspaper, oldest daily newspaper, can be found at www.haaretz.com. <laughs> a veteran of Haaretz since 1989, Ben held several writing and editing positions in the paper, including diplomatic correspondent, chief news editor, and opinion editor before becoming the editor-in-chief. He has covered six Israeli prime ministers from Yitzhak Rabin through Benjamin Netanyahu's second term. His work appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Newsweek, The Guardian, and he holds a joint MBA degree from the Kellogg School of Management in Northwestern and the Recanati School of Business at Tel Aviv University. 
please join me in vigorously welcoming Conrad's Editor-in-Chief. <laughs> Welcome, Aluf. Thank you. Very nice to see you here finally. Uh, some of you may remember that Aluf had, uh, through Donnie Imbar, had an engagement to speak here about a year and a half ago, but was stopped literally as he was walking out the door to the airport because uh, of an assassination of a Hamas leader. Breaking news takes precedent over visiting Berkeley. I can't imagine why, but it did. <laughs> it turns out for the best, I think, because this is such a timely moment to be talking about Israel with all the issues, the, the peace process, the nuclear Iran, the slaughter in Syria, U.S.-Israeli relations, the press in Israel, and we'll try to uh, touch on all of those um, topics. But first, I do want to ask, how many of you have a subscription to Haaretz? And I can raise my hand. Whoa! Pretty impressive. More than I would have thought, I would say. That's great. Um, so let's just um, begin. Um, we all read daily, or pretty much daily, but about U.S. Secretary of State Kerry working uh, intensely on a set of principles to lead Israeli and Israelis and Palestinians towards an agreement on status or peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. And at the center of this, besides Kerry, is Netanyahu. So um, I've actually been listening to Alu for uh, two days now, and I know he can talk on everything at the drop of a at the least question. So I was going to ask to start there about Obama's, um, whether this is the moment that Prime Minister Netanyahu um, would use his considerable uh, political power and um, yield to Obama's efforts or Kerry's efforts in, in the Middle East. You know, first of all, I don't know. <laughs> because, and, I don't know because, and I don't know because of uh, several factors. You know, we went through several major surprises uh, in the past year or even less than a year and, uh, and one of them was the energy, devotion and determination of Secretary Kerry to, to, re to rebuild the, the peace process that was all but dead and gone for several years. And, I don't, and if you recall when, when Obama put together his uh, second administration team the main focus, as far as Israel was concerned, was about Chuck Hagel and his problematic mm -hmm. uh, previous relationship with the pro-Israel lobby. And Kerry was seen as a kind of semi-retiree who got this uh, compensation job at the Secretary of State after losing the presidential bid, and nobody paid any serious attention to him. And I think everybody was taken by surprise when he started appearing on our doorstep every other week and actually bringing President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu, pulling them towards some sort of uh, document, principles, paper, plan, no matter how you call it. And gradually, it was funny because at the beginning, very few Israelis even paid attention to it. It was, eh, well, another American peace emissary coming to the region. You know, we've seen many of them in the past 50 years. Here's, a, here's another one who will get nowhere. And over time, it started filtering into the political discourse within Israel to the extent that the right-wing politicians, uh, some of them started portraying Kerry as the new enemy of Israel. Huh. And the defense minister named him uh, messianically obsessive about it. While, while uh, Foreign Minister Lieberman used Kerry to reposition himself at the political center by saying that Kerry is the greatest friend of Israel and that Israel would never get a better proposal than Kerry's. So Kerry became a factor. Now, is that, enough to, is that enough to bring Israelis and Palestinians to sign an agreement? It's too early to tell. First of all, all we're talking about now is some sort of agreed principles to facilitate more conversations mm -hmm. and more negotiations. Number two, you said Obama, and then you said Obama a, a Kerry. Mm -hmm. That's another mystery. To what extent is the president behind is Secretary of State. The President allowed the Secretary of State to play with it, but is he willing to give him the entire power of the presidency to push Netanyahu and Abbas towards decisions they don't like to take? Or is it a kind of political play in which if Kerry succeeds, it's to Obama's credit as well, and if Kerry fails, let him be the scapegoat mm -hmm. and, and keep the President out of it. 
as it appears, and, and we read it in, in Obama's interview with uh, David Remnick at the New Yorker, mm -hmm. Obama said that he believed that there's less than half a chance to, for it to, to, to bring peace or to bring an agreement, but, but we must try. Mm -hmm. So Kerry has a considerable work to do, not only in Ramallah or in Jerusalem, but also in, in the DC? White House, to, to convince people there that, that, that something good can, may come out of this thing. And, and where is Netanyahu in, in, his, in, in terms of his willingness to do something about, the, about moving the peace forward, or these talks forward? Ideologically, Netanyahu uh, never supported the two-state solution. This is not something that he got from his, uh, mm. from his father. It's not something that his father taught him. Yeah, to people do good say. For yeah, yeah. And yet, five years ago, as response to Obama's Cairo address, Netanyahu stood up and said, for the first time, he uttered the word Palestinian state as something that would be good for Israel hmm. in the Bar Ilan speech. And then nothing happened. Hmm. And the mystery was still, and it's still up in the air. Was it serious? Was it, was it just some lip service to, to please Obama and then, and then move on? And we hear, you know, we can, we can read Netanyahu either way. Uh, some days he gets up and says, uh, we must avoid a binational state. And we must avoid ruling over the Palestinians. Or in other words, the Palestinian state is a good thing. The next day, he wakes up uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, as we say in Israel, on his other side, as we say in Israel, and then he's like, uh, he and his lieutenants are like, Abu Mazen is the worst anti-Semite, Palestinian incitement is the way, is worse than Hitler, or, or, or what have you. Hmm. So clearly, he has, you know, he's, he's debating with Within. himself what to do. Obviously, the easiest way out for Netanyahu from all this would be a Palestinian rejection of the American proposal, the Palestinian, the blame, all the blame on the Palestinians, as it happened in 2000, and once again to Olmert in 2008. It might happen again, and it might not. And the key issue here is for Netanyahu to say the one dreaded word, which is 1967, as the, as the basis point for a future border Borders. between Israel and Palestine. And what Kerry has been trying to do is, to, and, and Netanyahu responded to that, and Netanyahu so far has always refused to put forward any border Borders. proposition, mm -hmm. any delineation of borders, arguing that no matter what Israel would propose, the Palestinians will automatically reject it and ask for more. And, and, and in Netanyahu's view, it's better to have someone from the outside dictating rather than trying to negotiate with the Palestinians, which, which uh, is no point. No go. So, so he, he countered that with arguing that the Palestinians should recognize Israel's Jewishness, Israel is a Jewish state or the state of the Jewish people, and, and uh, which the Palestinians refuse. And what Kerry has been trying to do is to tell Abbas, look, say whatever Netanyahu wants. Because in the end of the day, if, if we are able to get Israel to agree to the border proposition, why does it matter what you say about Jewish or not Jewish? This come. would be determined by life anyway. And, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's difficult for Abbas too. Uh -huh. Well, Netanyahu preserves his right to take a stand or make a decision or express it. We do know that he's been very um, vocal about how he feels about uh, the United States um, friendship with Iran or this, the deal that they've made with Iran. And that, that uh, is very I wonder, vocal I about. I one more, one small but important point sure. about the okay. Palestinians. Netanyahu today holds uh, almost unprecedented political power in Israel. That, uh, it's for a reason why he's the longest serving prime minister we've had since David Ben-Gurion. He's number two now in, in prime ministerial uh, terms after, after the founder of Israel. And I think he holds a similar political power in the sense that there is no challenger either within or outside his party or his coalition. And that means that whatever deal Netanyahu agrees to will be accepted by the vast majority of the, of the Knesset and, and, the, and the big majority of Israelis. Mm -hmm. so, so in the question, is he willing and is he able to do it? If, is he willing and on, I don't know, but he's more politically, far more politically able to reach a deal with the Palestinians and pass it through the political system and the public than any other predecessor. Mm -hmm. Better than Rabin, who was, as we know, was assassinated yeah. because of it. 
better than, better than uh, uh, Barak, who went to Camp David with only one quarter of the Knesset behind him, mm -hmm. better than Olmert, who negotiated with Abu Mazen when he was uh, not even a lame duck, he was a crawling duck uh, <laughs> waiting for his ouster. <laughs> Now, now, you asked about Iran. On Iran, too, we, we faced a major surprise. You know, after eight years of, of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was the, the greatest asset of uh, Israeli Asbara ever, <laughs> the Iranians elected Rouhani. And the rise of Rouhani paved the way for the American-Iranian detente after over 30 years, almost 35 years of, of adversity. Now we know that, uh, that American-Iranian contacts began even before that. but but but. Clearly, everybody was taken by surprise. Uh, most Israeli pundits and officials uh, argued that the Iranian election uh, is totally unimportant. But it was important because it gave a public face to Iranians, to the Iranian rapprochement with the West. Mm -hmm. And clearly, this is uh, the highest priority in Obama's foreign policy these days, more than the Kerry mission, more than dealing with other problems in the Middle East or, or other problems altogether. You know, there are always crises like in the Ukraine. But clearly, the, the most important effort is the, is the detente with Iran. And Netanyahu and his, and his new friends, the Saudis, and the mm -hmm. older friends, the Jordanians and others uh, in the Middle East, uh, felt betrayed. Because you see the United States siding with the Shiites rather than the Sunnis. And, and uh, the Sunnis and Israel felt that something very fundamental is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they change the rules of the game without asking us. Having, and Netanyahu called the interim agreement, nuclear agreement with Iran, an historic mistake. And, and every other day, he puts out a press release about the atrocities that the Iranians are, are, are standing behind in Syria, in other places. But clearly, in the end of the day, Netanyahu is aware that Israel is small, and the United States and its partners in, in these Iran talks are much bigger. And in the end of the day, he accepted what America did. He did not bomb Iran, despite threats or rumors or hints to the contrary, and spending billions of shekels in military preparations. Nothing happened. Oh. Israel did nothing. You know, there was some covert action and, and, and computer and cyber war, but this doesn't change anything fundamentally. But there was talk for a long time that there might be a strike that uh, could they get there? Could, they get, could the pilots get there and then get back? Could they? It was, it was, it was uh, really high on the agenda last summer. Mm -hmm. When Israelis felt that it's, uh, not last summer, the summer before, the, the summer of, of 2012, 12. when, when uh, Israelis felt that this is the last chance before the American election. When, look, the, the main problem with uh, attacking Iran, let, let's put the operational issues and considerations aside, Contact. because uh -huh. I don't really know what are the capabilities. But let's assume that Israel can actually fly to Iran and fly back, and, and bomb something in between, but then what? Well, there will there'll be a retaliation. And if there's a retaliation, and Israel is attacked by thousands of missiles from Lebanon, from Gaza, from Iran itself, at that time even Syria was considered a, a possible candidate for that, where is Israel going to turn to to get, uh, to get diplomatic support, to get ammunition, to get intelligence, to get anything to America. Now, if Israel does something against uh, explicit American wishes, it, it's very, it's gonna be, and, and since, since Israel could not trust Obama to stand by it by all means, the idea was that before the American election, you can raise the issue, ah. because then Obama facing re-election would find it very hard to tell Israel, look, you did what you did. Now you're on your own. Call me when it's over. Mm -hmm. But to this day, I'm not sure whether this was a serious proposition on the part of Netanyahu and then Defense Minister Barak to actually bomb Iran, or what they really did try to achieve is to focus the global attention on it mm -hmm. in order to, to strengthen the sanctions, which, which they achieved. Mm -hmm. And then Netanyahu went, after about six weeks of high tension, Netanyahu went to the United Nations and uh, with his cartoon of the Iranian right. bomb. You know that Netanyahu is an architect by, by training. Ah. He graduated from MIT, and, the, and he, he likes to express himself in, in drawings. He draws, uh, <laughs> he draws horses and elephants in, wow. in, in meetings. <laughs> he is, 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 is drawing elephants and, and horses, and, uh, and buildings, although I don't think he ever designed an actual building hmm. as an architect. 
so, so he drew this cartoon, but basically came to the, the, the UN to say, we surrender, we're not going to bomb anyone. And now obviously Israel is not going to be crazy and, and try to derail the most important uh, international diplomatic effort by going to war. So either you're expecting these talks to fail, and then expect Obama to fulfill on his, on his promise uh, that all options are on the table. Or you learn to live with, uh, what, what's more reasonable is you learn to live with Iran that has this enriched uranium, that, that has this capability, that can build a bomb uh, rather short, on a rather short notice, and, and develop your uh, strategy and deterrence according to that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, not clear where Obama stands in terms of support of Israel. What, what, how, how do you view Obama in terms of his relationship to Israel? I think there are three important points during the Obama presidency vis-a-vis -vis Israel. The first one was his first visit to the Middle East, where he, where he visited Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, and gave his Cairo address, which was aimed at fixing America's relations with the Arab world. And clearly, his aim at that time <clears throat> was to unbush American foreign policy. And clearly, he believed the argument that appearing to be too supportive of Israel cost America with its friendships in the Arab world. Mm. And, and, uh, a lot of, and lost a lot of support in the Arab world because of that. And he intentionally skipped Israel. Mm -hmm. He went to a German concentration camp. Right. That was the Jewish part, of the Jewish leg of that trip. Mm -hmm. But he skipped Israel on purpose. And then, and, and that turned many Israelis away from him. Clearly, he doesn't have a neck for Israel like his two immediate predecessors, Clinton and Bush. It's not a partisan thing. And, and, uh, and so, and so right-wing Israelis saw Obama as someone who's, who's a die-hard peacenik, who, who would do anything to push Israel out of the settlements and to, and to prevent it from bombing Iran, and they, they didn't like his politics. Left-wing Israelis were disappointed because they expected Obama to be the one American president who is less afraid of uh, pro-Israeli influence and would drive Israel out of the territories. Mm. And when, and so everybody was disappointed. Mm -hmm. And then came the second term, and the first thing Obama, Obama did in the second term was to visit Israel. You know, in between was the, the short-lived and, and ill-fated settlement freeze, and more importantly, the, the Arab Spring revolutions, which changed the landscape around Israel. So Obama comes to Israel last year, and he delivers this amazing speech in Jerusalem. Very well crafted, with one half aiming at the right ear of Israelis, uh, mm -hmm. speaking about the ties of the Jewish people and the Jewish nation to the land of Israel and the Bible and history and so on, which the right-wingers applauded, and then talking about dignity and, 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 uh, and the human rights of the Palestinians, which the leftists uh, applauded. And I think he, at that time, he was able to erase the suspicions of Israelis about his friendship. But it didn't last long, and, and the other turning point was in September, when America was about to bomb Syria, and then, and then refrained and came out with, with in my view, uh, a very, uh, very successful diplomatic deal <clears throat> to keep Assad in power in return for his chemical weapons. Now here it gets complicated. Politically, strategically, diplomatically, Obama, sided with Netanyahu. Netanyahu sided with Assad from the beginning of the Syrian conflict, viewing him as the lesser evil and better than any Sunni radical possible alternative. Hmm. So he did whatever he could to refrain from intervening, you know, being dragged into the Syrian civil war and not doing anything to support or overtly support the rebels and, and uh, just st standing by. And Obama was the one saying that Assad must go, that he lost his legitimacy, and so on. So politically, Obama comes to accept Netanyahu's policy. Mm. But when, when, when Israelis th are thinking about it, what they see is, look, hundreds of thousands of people are butchered across the border. This is not in Rwanda. This is not in Yugoslavia in the 90s. This is not in the Holocaust. It's now with Twitter, with Facebook, with the, with all, the entire world watching it. Mm -hmm. And America, rather than help these poor people, eventually cuts a deal, cuts its way out to the, through a deal with the dictator. And then, then Israelis ask themselves, okay, now what if we get into trouble? Ah. 
will, will Obama come to help us or find a way around the issue? And, and I think that, that once again brought deep suspicions Toward among Israelis towards the, the mm. commitment of Obama mm. to actually support us if we get into trouble. Mm. Uh, if Netanyahu were not Netanyahu, if there was someone else, or if there was, what, what would be the critical differences or crucial differences? Well, one of Netanyahu's tragedies as prime minister is that he always served facing a Democrat at oh. the White House. He never had, you know, Net Netanyahu clearly by, by, his, by, his, by his politics, if he were to stay in America, and, and, uh, and not come back to Israel and, and become an American politician. He could clearly have been a Republican Elected. congressman or senator, <laughs> and, and a very successful one, I, I guess. And, uh, and he had to work with the Democrats at the White House. And, and it shows. It's very difficult to reconcile the politics of someone like Obama and someone like Netanyahu on any issue, even not on not just the peace process, even on, on the economy or education, or, or, or a relationship between mainstream and, and minorities in society, and so on. Now, Bush, Bush sided with Israel on anything that had to do with using force, be it in the West Bank, or Gaza, or, or, um, or in Syria, or in Lebanon, and so on. But Bush's foreign policy was mostly ran by Condoleezza Rice. And Condoleezza Rice, unlike Bush, her politics on, on Israel and the Palestinians are very similar to Obama's. Uh. I don't think there's any difference between Susan Rice and Condoleezza Rice uh. in terms of how they see the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. Sus uh, Condoleezza Rice was strictly opposed to the settlements. And we have to remember that under Bush, Israel removed 25 settlements. And that's more than under any other American president. Mm -hmm. And it would never have happened without Bush's support and a and, and, uh, letter okay, he wrote to Sharon and so on to help convince the Israeli public about it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think that if Bush were the president today, you know, it all depends on the circumstances. Right. If Bush and his administration thought that driving Israel out of West Bank settlements and pushing forward a peace process is good for America's interests, they would, they would do it. I don't mm -hmm. think they had some inherent support for uh, Israel's occupation and settlements. On the contrary. Mm -hmm. um, talking about moving the settlements, there's been, um, if, if things don't move forward or if, or if uh, Netanyahu stands strong on not moving the settlements, isn't there a danger of their, Israel becoming more and more isolated in, in of course their there country? Of course which leads us to the to another surprise after we had the, the change in Iran and, and the Kerry. Kerry mission and the change of Obama's heart on Syria. The last but not least one, as far as Israel is concerned, is the rise of the BDS movement. Mm -hmm. Not so much in practical terms. It has very little effect on, on the Israeli economy. But for the first time in, in, in the past six months or so, it moved from the fringe of debate to the living room. And in that I mean that all those Israeli politicians and pundits who support the Kerry mission and, and, and support its consequences, i.e. I, uh, uh, giving, giving away territory and, and settlement removal, argue that if, if Israel doesn't do it, it would face an ever-growing BDS campaign that eventually would affect its ability to conduct its economy. And I think that the, that the the emotional appeal here is even stronger than just mm -hmm. judging it by economic terms. And the emotional thing is that the Israeli self-perception self of the Israeli mainstream is that we are part of the West. Okay, unfortunately, we have to live in a more dangerous environment and neighborhood than those, in, I don't know, in Finland or, or, in, or, in, uh, or in America or in Australia. But still, we share the same values, we share the same economic system, we are democracy, and so on. And if the West is telling Israel, no, you're not part of us, or the price of admission or readmission to the club is to get rid of occupation and settlements, this would bring the, the dilemma home to Israelis and to Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu mm -hmm. is one of the major uh, proponents of the idea that Israel is the West and not uh, some developed Middle Eastern, economically, an economically developed uh, Middle Eastern country. 
and again, the, the Netanyahu's response to this has been calling, the, calling it anti-Semitism. And that all these critics of Israel, all they want to do is a second Holocaust, or, mm -hmm. or at least uh, to destroy Israel's independence, uh, mm -hmm. kind of politicize. But this will get you only so far. And, and uh, it's not a substitute for a more proactive policy. And the way, you know, the way to defeat the BDS is to change your behavior that, that fuels the BDS campaign. And that is the ongoing occupation and settlements. Now, why did it happen this year, not 10 years ago or 20 years ago? The occupation and settlements were there just like now. Mm -hmm. Why the occupation is now once again debated in Israel after several years in which the word was barely mentioned beyond the pages of Haaretz? <laughs> I think there are several reasons to that, but the most important one is the, is the, the success of the right wing in the election, the far right party, the Jewish home, the settler party. For the first time, Israeli officials started boasting about settlement expansion. For many years, Israel did it below the radar. For example, when Ehud Olmert uh, uh, ended his term, his office put out a nice brochure uh, laying out all his achievements in office for three years. And there was a huge chapter devoted to housing and, and development. Not one word about, uh, about what this government did in the West Bank, where it built thousands and thousands of new, of new housing units. But this wasn't even mentioned. But today, the government is boasting about it. So the reaction is, hey guys, relax. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you're really, if you're really serious about annexing the West Bank, expelling the Palestinians, uh, 60 or 50,000 Palestinians live in Area C under Israeli control, uh, pushing them to join the Palestinian communities in the Palestinian Authority. If you're serious about that, then face the consequences, mm. and the consequences, and, th and then came the European decision to condition any cooperation with Israel on not on on on, on being st st uh, strictly limited to, to Green Line Israel, mm -hmm. and then came the death of Mandela, which had nothing to do with Israel directly, but fueled the Israel is apartheid campaign, and uh, Netanyahu Netanyahu plays. Once again, an ambiguous role here. On one hand, he, he calls it anti-Semitism and so on. On the other hand, he surrendered to all the European demands. Ah. When, when, the, when the leaders of Israeli academia came to him and said, look, if we lose the European R&D grants, we're in serious trouble. So forget about all this uh, raising the flag of, of uh, our old ties to the, the Bible and the nation of Israel uh, to, to Hebron or to, or to Bethel. And, and agree to what the Europeans are demanding. Just for the occupation, <coughs> occupied territory. Yes, right? yeah. and, and more of, yeah, because they said if, if we want to get these R&D grants, and Israel is the largest recipient of R&D grants uh, outside the, the, the EU itself, and mm -hmm. I think even more than many members, member states of the EU in, in, any, in any event, not one euro could be spent across the green line. So the University of Ariel could get nothing from mm -hmm. that. Now, obviously, the University of Ariel was one of the major flags of the right-wing government, one ah. of their major successes to create a university of the, uh, in Ariel, in occupied territory. So Netanyahu agreed to that. But moreover, when, when he had to explain why he joined the Kerry talks, one of his uh, explanations was that if we don't do that, we'll face the BDS. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll face boycott. So we'd rather... Go on with the talks. Do you think the um, the threat of the boycotts, it, it, has, what, to what extent is a, a real threat to Israel's economy? Well, you know, it, I it, mean, I'm thinking of it, depen of. it depends on the boycott. I'm just thinking of Netanyahu in, in Davos when he stood up and said, we're open for business, basically extending business. Well, we're open for business, and only in the last week, you know, we're here in Silicon Valley, two Israeli companies were bought, one by a Japanese company for $900 million, and the other was uh, started by three young guys who just graduated from the army, and they were bought by Google for an undisclosed sum of Multi -million money. Multi-million dollar and, something. And, and so on, and, and you know, so, and not, not one of the major multinationals with branches in Israel pulled out. Mm -hmm. And remember one more thing about Israeli economy and the boycott. Israel has been facing the Arab boycott 
since even before the state, since the Yishuv days. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I grew up, we didn't have Toyota cars in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, we had only Subarus. McDonald's, op McDonald's opened its, fir its first branch, first restaurant in Israel only after Oslo. Wow. Before that, they refused to come to Israel. You know, one of the treats for Israelis going abroad, and Donnie must remember that in the 70s <laughs> and 80s, we were to eat at McDonald's, and not at the Israeli, not at the Israeli copycat McDavid. <laughs> not as good. And to us, McDonald's was the forbidden food. It was gourmet, not junk food. So, so Israel built, and, and, the, and, and the outcome was that Israel built an economy that is mostly below the radar. It's very difficult to have a consumer boycott of Israeli products because if you go to any store anywhere in the world, you don't find Israeli products. Why? Because, because of the Arab boycott, Israel built an export economy that is mostly B2B and B2G. B2G is selling arms, and, and B2B is, you know, if you, you know, if you take your phone and, and you know, maybe in the application there you have hundreds of hours of brain work of Israeli engineers and, and programmers, but it says Apple or, or whatever. Ah, uh -huh. It's not identified as Israeli. So and therefore, mm. boycotting Israel is more difficult because Israel lives through boycott. But clearly, if all these multi, if, if multinationals pulled out, and if export, and if Israelis would have to apply for visas to visit Europe and so on, people would feel it. Right. But I, I think we're really far away from that point. Mm -hmm. And once again, I think that the emotional and image part of that is no less important than the sheer economic terms. Mm -hmm. Actually, the business about being ashamed or feeling un, uh, ashamed about this um, perceived, anti, you know, that no, no longer part of the West, I'm wondering if you think that that's already being felt, especially by the younger generation, or how much is being felt through Israeli society? I don't think so. I, I think the Not opposite. Yet. I think the younger generation, at least of, of Israeli seculars, is, is uh, feel, if anything, it feels even more part of the West because that's the internet generation. Mm -hmm. And today, you can consume all your English language culture in Israel, you know, in real time. You don't have to wait until they broadcast the show in Israel a year after it ended in the United States. You don't have to read the book only when someone brings it to you from the store because you can buy it in Kindle in real time. And, and you can live culturally in Berlin or, or, in, or in Manhattan or anywhere while still being in Israel. So I don't think that the younger Israelis feel disconnected from the West. But to them, if they will face a situation like that, and again, it's, it's far more complicated. For example, uh, many Israelis hold foreign passports. Mm -hmm. So they would be able to travel freely wherever they want, while others would have to apply for visas. So that would create gaps within Israel as well. Mm. It's, it's, it's a far more nuanced situation than, than uh, we can think of. Um, speaking of the difference, there is, um, I think you've mentioned that there is a um, sort of, um, not a falling apart, but there's a lot of different elements now in the Israeli society. No longer, there's no cohesiveness to the, you know, there's the ultra-Orthodox, there's the um, secular Jews, there's, there's sort of this, um, just a very diversified economy, and how that will impact any well, uh, serious e efforts uh, in peace or... Um Three months ago, our national singer, Arik Einstein, oh, passed away. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of mourning in the country and so on, and, and, and I asked myself, could there be a present-day Arik Einstein? Mm. And if not, why? And there is none. And, and why not? Not because nobody could reach the, the quality of Arik Einstein singing, as, a, as, as great as it, as, it, as it was, but because Arik Einstein was the product of a period when Israel had one single television channel mm -hmm. and two and a half national radio channels. So if you wanted to listen to music, what you heard was Arik Einstein. There was no alternative. Today, you can tune to whatever you want. There is no one, I mean, still reality shows attract uh, many television viewers. But this is kind of the only, the only uh, thing that unifies 
Israelis and even our, not all of them. Now society is basically broken uh, among five different groups. Also Orthodox Jews, Arabic speakers, that are also subdivided, but let's not, <laughs> let's not complicate <laughs> too much. Uh, seculars and, uh, and uh, modern Orthodox, or as we call them, national religious, that is uh, the settler movement and, and its supporters, and, and Russian speakers, oh, yeah. who are by and large very secular, but come what have somewhat different set of values than the more veteran seculars who came, for example, the, you know, where I come from, I was born in a very socialist state uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the Russian socialism was anathema after what they had to endure under the Soviet system. So they supported the right-wing parties. But on, on religious affairs, obviously, they are the most secular. Many of them are not even Jewish by any rabbinic or lachaic uh, definition. And these tribes are growingly uh, uh, moving apart culturally mm. and politically. And, and the most important driving force for that change in Israel is, is demography, is the maternity wars, <laughs> in which uh, you know, most of the kids that are, that are born in Israel are born into ultra-Orthodox Jewish families or Arab families. And today, in, in first and second grade Israeli schools, about half the kids are either Arab or ultra-Orthodox. Wow. That implies that in the, the, the majority will not be, this, these minorities are not drafted to the army. So right. the idea of a popular army is, is, is disappearing, when only a minority would, would even be drafted. And then, and then they're underemployed for different reasons. But again, can, it, can the economy sustain a growing number of unemployed people living on welfare? It can for a while because of natural gas discoveries. But, this, mm -hmm. but then again, it's a very different Israel than high-tech Israel. Mm -hmm. So the social gaps will only widen. And last but not least, these two minorities are not Zionist. Mm -hmm. Again, for different reasons. But the non-Zionist voice in Israel is rising. And the current coalition and the current election was mostly about that issue, not mm -hmm. about peace and war. It was about that issue, thinly disguised as uh, you know, the issues of drafting the Haredim or, or uh, the prices of uh, food staples and real estate. But you built, Netanyahu built a coalition with Lapid, with Bennett, and Tzipi Livni, and Lieberman, that is the veteran, seculars, national religious, and <laughs> Russians leaving out the Arabs and the ultra-Orthodox. Now, the Arabs were never directly mm. a part of a coalition, but they had indirect influence over, over the Labour yeah. Party or Kadima mm -hmm. through primaries and so on. And the minorities were left out, and the government's main effort was to push them further away. And the, the Haredim through the draft, mm -hmm. or partial draft, the Arab community mostly through a plan to, to uh, relocate 30,000 Bedouins in the Negev. And well, so yeah, far, the minorities have been able to, to derail uh, these government efforts and to show the government that you know, they, they cannot be played around. And, and that's when they're out of office, and when in the Knesset together, the Arabs and ultra-Orthodox are about 26, 27 members of Knesset. But if, if we extrapolate, it's going to be a very, very different Israel. And again, immigration out of Israel, and, and, and you know it very well here at the Bay Area, hmm. is mostly of seculars. Hmm. There are not many, many people from Nazareth or from Mea Shearim emigrating out of Israel. Wow, interesting. Yet another issue, a problem. Um, but I, uh, I, before we go to questions, I do want to spend a little time talking about, since you are the editor-in-chief of Haar, it's a little bit about what's going on with the Israeli press. Um, what is the state of the Israeli press today? Like, you know, it's a, it's a school of journalism, and I, I don't need to teach you that all of us in the print media and, and television or broadcast have to deal with uh, the thing to change to digital. And, uh, you know, most of us in this room read, if not all of us, read some form of news 
on some form of uh, digital uh, device, uh, device yeah. but uh, I don't believe that even the majority here, or maybe maybe half the people here, bother to read a print newspaper today, mm -hmm. or or watch television. Everybody needs to deal with that. Now in Israel, interestingly, the number of newspapers is on the rise. Mm, that's not only so that the newspapers are not going down, it's on the rise. And even newspapers that were totally broke, like Mariv, once the newspaper of Israel They're was online. a kid, yeah. and today yeah. it reached the verge of extinction, but then saved by the bell in the last moment, bought by, someone, by, by a right-wing guy who wants to make it into the Haaretz of the right-wing, <laughs> like a right-wing form of Haaretz. Is it in print or just online? It's both. It's both. Print. No, no, I'm talking about print newspapers. Yeah, 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 okay. We have more print newspapers than at any point in the past 30 or 40 wow. years in Israel. Some of them subsidized, like Israel Ayom, the largest circulated newspaper funded by Sheldon, Sheldon. Anderson. Oh, mm -hmm. Others, free, which is other, free. Which is free. Others, others rely on advertising and so on. But, but uh, clearly, the industry is, is changing. It's not dying in any way. But the challenge for all of us is how to reach out to a younger generation of readers, viewers, surfers, whichever <laughs> name, name you want to call them, and, and consumers, and, and be relevant to them and eventually have them pay for the service. Now, Haaretz has always been left-leaning uh, with a lot of variety of uh, commentators, but isn't it true that most of Israel is moving away from the left and toward the center, and how does that impact Haaretz and your I, You know, I, I don't think so. Look at, look at the, first of all, the definitions of right and left are changing. Uh, today there is, well, not today, in the past three years, we see a resurrection of the social left. Mm. Which was almost which almost disappeared uh, since the mid '80s in Israel when mm -hmm. the trade unions and the kibbutz movement mm -hmm. collapsed and uh, capitalism mm -hmm. carried the day for for over two decades and then the younger generation realized that all that you know that our parents in their union jobs were paid less but had a much higher quality of life given job security and and, and secure pensions mm -hmm. that we don't have and and so you had a resurrection of the socialist movement in Israel. And that's a very strong voice, so far lacking the ability to change the government policy. Uh, and, 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 when, and on peace and war matters, again, when you have Netanyahu, the leader of the right wing, saying Palestinian state, which was taboo only 30 years ago, even mainstream leftists wouldn't say it. No, right. So, you know, the, the earth is shifting. Now look at, look at merits, the left wing part the designated left-wing party. It went down from 12 seats, its highest achievement in 92, to mm. the verge of extinction with three seats in, in the previous Knesset wow. in 2009. Now it's doubled to six, and the polls giving it 12. Ah. So there is a resurrection of the left in Israel, mostly, through, mostly because Meretz is the true opposition to Netanyahu. The Labour Party appears to be uh, dying to get into Netanyahu's coalition. Ah. And he doesn't criticize Netanyahu, not even, not even on social affairs. So, you know, the, always, there's always a strong mainstream uh, that, that we, we don't belong to and we're not trying to be, we're not trying to be the mainstream. Aretz, since its inception almost 100 years ago, adopted a critical position. And to be critical, you need to be a little bit on the side of things, and not the mainstream. Mm -hmm. The mainstream is struggling to. The mainstream is struggling between several issues. One is the role of religion mm -hmm. and tradition in public life, and that's always a big, very big issue in Israel, and no less so today. And the mainstream is struggling with the role of the military in public life. The uh, the the mainstream newspaper, and Channel Two, the mainstream TV channel, are very much adoring and admiring the military. Oh. Is, uh, is a kind of a, of a secular religion to them. Huh. I mean, they are secular, they would publish uh, non-kosher recipes, <laughs> but, but, uh, but most newspapers in Israel would not. Hmm. But uh, very much supportive of the army. And uh, there is a struggle for, for the mainstream to, to define itself, mm -hmm. where it is facing the rise of minorities 
who couldn't care less, that, you know, the Arabs and all ultra Orthodox couldn't care Could less care about less military well. heroism right, and, right. and that kind of stuff. Mm. Okay, well, before we, we're going to go to questions now, and uh, Andre, if you want to come up and take a mic. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, you are at a journalism school here, and I was wondering if you could speak on the role of censorship in Israeli media, what it's like to operate under censorship, and could you tell us something that you've had to censor recently? Well, if I had to censor, I can't talk about it. <laughs> but, uh, you can't print it. Can you talk about it? <laughs> Look, the, the, the way it operates is that we, we operate under both a law and an agreement between the media and the government on how to implement that law. And the law says that if you want to publish something related to national security, the army, uh, nuclear affairs, and certain aspects of foreign policy, like contacts with, uh, secret contacts with, uh, I don't know, with Arab countries, then it has to go through the military censor. You send them the copy, they go over it, they get it back to you, it's done pretty quickly. You know, they're, they're aware of, the, of news deadlines. And uh, most of the time, you get clearance. Uh, less frequently, you get uh, changes in the copy uh, or deletions. Very rarely, the entire story is deleted. Now, the, the, the legal scope of that was limited about 25 years ago by the Supreme Court. When we appealed, it was, it was an appeal based on a story of mine about the Mossad intelligence agency. At that time, we were not allowed to write anything about the Mossad. And I wrote a story that, by today's standards, was pretty naive about the coming changes at the head of the agency. And it was, uh, it was banned from publication. We appealed. We won the appeal. And the court said that the censorship can be applied only when there is a close proximity to grave harm to national security. Uh, or in other words, with prudence. And then the government used that to say that, OK, we can't trust the censor anymore. Oh. Now, now, as, now, as long as you are, <laughs> let's add two more things. As long as you operate under this system, you're totally immune from any, you're free from any responsibility to the consequences of what you're publishing. We, you, if, you pub, if something went through censor, through the censor's office, nobody could blame you or investigate you or charge you for uh, doing anything uh, to harm national security. And that, when I, when I met my colleagues at The Guardian, who are facing political and legal mm. problems with the NSA revelations. Mm. Uh, and, and they asked me, how are you dealing with that? Because they were blamed. They were said, how can you, Mr. Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian, decide what might harm, might, might harm security and what not? I'm free from that decision. And moreover, you know, Israel being Israel, we're not talking here about faceless bureaucrats sitting in some fortress without any contact. These are people you know, you, uh, you call each other by first name, and you can negotiate with them. And more often than not, you know what would pass and what not. And the usual way of, of, uh, of going around it is that if anything was published outside of Israel, you can quote it freely and relate it to foreign sources. And then they don't care. And, and I, wanna, I don't even bother to go through uh, the explanation why, why is it so. Uh, basically, the government's case is that they argue that whatever is published by Israeli media, since it relies on official sources, huh. it's interpreted as kind of official statement. So if I say Israel has nuclear weapons, it's like the prime minister says so. But if I say that foreign sources said that Israel have nu has nuclear weapons, then it's OK. <laughs> bizarre, but you know, that, that's the, that, not the only bizarre thing we live through. Okay. Are, there, sorry, are, there, are there specific challenges that you face of operating under censorship? I mean, here at Graduate well, School of Journalism, we the have basic, sensitivity. No, no, but then, no, but then, but then the, the, at some point, the government decided that censorship is not enough. It's not enough because its scope is not wide enough. It's not enough. Look, I cannot, this is not grave harm to national security. I cannot censor that. Or this was published elsewhere, and I can't. And I can't forbid the Israeli media from, from quoting it. 
So what the government does is rely more and more on court issued gag orders. Now, oh. if you disobey a gag order, then it's criminal. Then you're, you're, you can be charged for contempt of court and face whatever the, the criminal cause, code has to say about that. And so that's a kind of second layer of censorship. And, uh, and uh, this one we were facing when the Ben Ziger, when Ben Ziger was an Australian guy who made Aliyah to Israel, uh, recruited by the Mossad, did something bad, uh, uh, exposed whatever, they argue that he exposed some agents or methods, I don't know exactly, he was brought back to Israel, detained in secret, and committed suicide. Before being formally indicted, he committed suicide in the prison. The story leaked to a couple of websites outside of Israel. It was under, the Israeli media was under strict gag order, not even to quote from foreign sources. And then mm. the Australian Broadcasting Service, um, ABC, blew the story several months ago, wide open, or about a year ago, wide, wide open. We quoted their story. The government argued that uh, we disobeyed the gag order and uh, that we need to take it offline. And I was threatened by prosecution and, uh, and so on. And uh, eventually the government, eventually it cracked. Not the, not the core of the espionage suspicions against the gear, although, although today a new book, book about it published, was published in Australia with some mm. version of the story. But they had to let out the investigation carried out uh, over the, the suicide, how did it happen? Uh, who was involved? What was the, the who was, who was uh, responsible for keeping him alive in the prison service, and all that? So that that's the kind of struggle that we have all the time. We're facing similar struggles over police matters. The police also is very very keen on on requesting gag orders for over many investigations, and almost every week we have to face some legal challenge. Uh, over that. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, do you support the divestment campaign? No. And uh, so, why, so it sounded like uh, it's done uh, good uh, to the Israeli left in the cause of the Israeli left. I don't think it's done good to the Israeli left. It, it helped the, the Israeli public opinion to deal with the, the issue of occupation and settlements once again. But you know, I think that the best way to, to counter the, this campaign is not to call it anti-Semitic, which, which Net as Netanyahu does, which would get you only so far, but with a more proactive policy to, to undermine the reasons or the justifications of that campaign, namely end the occupation and settlements. Sure. Uh, welcome as a uh, subscriber to Haaretz. Uh, uh, when I speak with my fellow subscribers, in Israel about international public opinion, they're not surprised that there's so much alienation from Israel in Europe and uh, because they say, well, it's Europe and we know the history. And when there are falsifications or imbalanced perspectives written in publications such as The Guardian or promulgated via BBC, they're not surprised. But what they don't seem to comprehend is the incredible growth of antipathy to Israel on American campuses. They believe that American public opinion will support Israel ad infinitum. And what they don't see here is all the rubbish promulgated on campuses where students uh, have no notion of the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and have very little sense of what is actually going on. They're hit daily by our feminists uh, will not condemn the Palestinian treatment of women, our gay people will condemn Israel. So, so your and so question, and, and your so question. So the question, thank you. Yes. The question is, is the Israeli public opinion, particularly left liberals like myself, readers of Haaretz, aware of the growing antipathy and promulgation of falsehoods on American campuses okay. about Israel, the one place where it's kosher to hate? The short answer is yes. It's not about, you know, I don't know if they know the, the, the details or, or if everything is falsification and, and, or, or 
only some of it, but they do know that in American campuses there is there is a growing criticism of Israel. Of course, they know it. You know, it's, it's been reported in Israel Widely. all the time, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's not it's not news to Israelis. But uh, but uh, the question, in, in my view, is you know, from Israel, you cannot really change public perception of uh, Israel in Europe or in American campuses or in China or, or anywhere. And uh, the idea that if we only spent uh, 100 million more shekels on Asbara, this would change, is ridiculous. And, and, uh, and clearly, so to, to, to Israeli liberals, the issue of can we pr be proud of our country despite whatever is happening in the okay, West Bank is, is a growing question once yeah. again. And again, it's after about a decade in which the issue was barely discussed in Israel. The issue was, you know, we withdrew from Gaza, we built a barrier in the West Bank, uh, leave us alone, we don't want to hear about that anymore. And, uh, and uh, in the past year, it all came back again. Right. Hi, I'm enjoying this and I'm very caught up, but um, I want to go back to the two minority groups you mentioned earlier in your talk. I'm concerned about both. I'm concerned about the potential lack of full right and citizenship for the Arab-speaking population. And I'm concerned about the ongoing benefits given to a group that's, as you say, going to be swamping the demographics over time. Not just the exclusion from military service, but the lack of um, quality education and expectation of their participation in the economy. So I'd like to hear your opinion. My opinion is that, that this is the main problem that Israel is facing, the, the integration of minorities. And uh, you can't just overlook it and say, you can't, you can't punish them. If the gut reaction of politicians and pundits was, you know, if we don't like the minorities, let's punish them for being what they are, it's not going to work when, when they're growing. And it's not going to work when the economy needs this manpower and needs a more educated, uh, in, in, uh, to those in the audience who are less familiar with the Israeli education system, in ultra-orthodox schools, they teach the boys general studies like math, English, and sciences, very, very low level, and it ends at seventh grade. Mm. They're only allowed to study the Torah mm. and, and, and rabbinic studies. And they're supposed to spend their lives as students and study and teach the Torah for their entire lives, rather than work. To live, they have to rely either on their wives working or, or, uh, welfare. Some, uh, yeah. or welfare, yeah. and subsidized by, by the government. Yeah. And clearly to, to the Israeli government, and especially since the right wing took over in 77, the studying the Torah has been the top national priority. Look, if you look, if you look at budget allocations and if you look at, at the legislation, mm. it has been one of the top national priorities. Even when, again, when, when usually when prime ministers boast about the achievements of Israel, they tend to overlook that part. Uh -huh. You know, Netanyahu as prime minister, although the ultra orthodox were his most loyal political partners until last year, he never once visited an ultra orthodox town. He never once visited a high yeshiva. Mm. of the ultra-Orthodox. Wow. He did of, of the national Orthodox, not of the ultra-Orthodox. So to him, it's a matter of political expediency, not of, of uh, ideology. And still, the ultra-Orthodox have been able to use, to leverage a very considerable political power to achieve that. The problem is that, in, the problem is, so why not integrate them? You cannot force them out. How do you, how do you integrate them? And here, and here, politics come to play, because if Israel says we are a Jewish democratic state, to the Arabs, the Jewish part is anathema. They want it to be the state, and that, that's the official stated policy of the leadership or the representation of the Arab community in Israel, that Israel needs to be a state for all its citizens, with an ethnically and religiously blind model of citizenship like here or in France. Mm -hmm. To the ultra-Orthodox, they don't care about democracy. To them, democracy is asking the rabbi what to do. But they love the Jewish part. I mean, they don't like to see cars driven on, on Shabbat in the streets. Now, they know that, now both minorities know that it's, you know, that these visions are, are very far from being implemented. But, but my argument is that 
and, and the mainstream or the, the political mainstream led by Netanyahu in, in, in recent years strengthens, you know, is trying to strengthen the Zionist motives in, the, in education and talk about the Holocaust all the time as the unifying, the unifying idea of or, or the, the Minister of Education. Most recently there was a debate about free speech in schools. So he wrote a letter to teachers and said that there are three sensitive issues that should not be touched upon. Religion, the Holocaust, and the morality of the IDF, the legitimacy of the IDF. Hmm. Now, how can you tell that to hmm. the Arabs and, and ultra-Orthodox <laughs> uh, about the, the, the morality of the IDF, or the, the IDF as a kind of national symbol? To, right. it's, it's ridiculous. So far, there is not one serious political figure in Israel who has argued for a more inclusive national ethos that might in integrate the minorities to, to feel part of, of a unified state. Hmm. And since they're growing, the idea of a unified state Split. is growing for Split. falling apart. Wow. Wow. And, and I have no uh, easy solution for that. But clearly, it's, it's, it's there on the table to be picked up by, by brave politicians. You know, several months ago, the Israeli Supreme Court once again denied an appeal. In Israel, your nationality is... Uh, in Israel, it's different in Hebrew, but in, in, in Israel, nationality and citizenship are two different words, are two different concepts. So you can be an Israeli citizen, but in your ID card, the nationality is, is defined. You can be Jewish, you can be Arab, and you can be undefined. Mm -hmm. There are, there are uh, many Russian immigrants who are not Jewish, so mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are counted statistically with the Jewish community because we live, they live as part of the Jewish community, but their nationality is like undefined. So a group of people appealed to the Supreme Court, through the district court, to ask to be listed as Israelis. And the Supreme Court once again rejected the appeal and said there is no such thing as an Israeli nation. Because, you know, there, we have yet to see evidence that there is an Israeli nation. So uh -huh. one, one brilliant op-ed piece in our papers uh, asked that, that after 65 years, <laughs> what more evidence do you want to show that there is such thing as an Israeli nation? The, so the, 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 the state, not only the, the, the politician, but even the Supreme Court, that Against is the interest. bastion of liberalism <laughs> and civil rights in Israel, argues that there is no such thing <laughs> as being an Israeli. So the road is very far for integration. Paul. If Plan A, uh, being a negotiated settlement, fails, in what circumstance would you see the possibility of a Plan B being a uh, unilateral withdrawal by Israelis of portions of the West Bank? It depends on the circumstances. Look, if Israel decides that it's, that it's better to leave the West Bank, as it decided in Lebanon and Gaza, it would leave. The argument that it's impossible because it would be impossible to relocate the settlers it's a joke. Come on, Israel absorbed millions of people under worse conditions from, from Morocco, from Iraq, from Yemen, from, this, from the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 50s when, when yes, people had barely anything to eat in Israel. So the idea that you cannot relocate 100,000 settlers, most of whom work within the Green Line anyway, or many of them work within the Green Line anyway, is ridiculous. It's difficult, painful, but the argument that Israel, that it's impossible to do, that's the idea of the right wing, that they have been trying to promote it uh, uh, earnestly in, in recent years. But I think it's ridiculous. So under what circumstances do you think that that could actually happen? Under, what under, would it take to, to make that decision and say that... It would take unbearable pressure to keep these settlements, just as it happened in Gaza. Look, we, we, we've been through it only 10 years ago. It's still, it's still a very fresh memory. It's far more complicated in the West Bank. There are major settlement blocks. There is the issue of Jerusalem. It's far more difficult to withdraw to the Green Line as Sharon did in Gaza. But is it impossible? Well, it's possible. Is it, is it more, a more viable and possible option than trying to create an equal state of Israelis and Palestinians? I think so. So you've mentioned a few times that 
the right wing is basically stronger in Israel than it's ever been, and there isn't really a viable left wing alternative? No, no, I wasn't saying that. Okay. I'm, I was saying that the right wing has been in power for most of the period that Israel has existed, but I don't think they're, they barely won the election. We don't, Yair Lapid is not a leftist, and Tsipi Livni is not a leftist, but both support, generally support a two-state solution. So by that definition, they could be the, the, uh, the backbone of a left-wing government. The right-wing won the election uh, barely. They won 61 to 59. It was not a landslide. They, they, did better, they did better five years ago. But I guess my question is sort of given that, like, I know that there's a vital left wing in Israeli society, do you see a route towards a left wing government in the near future? And what do you think that government would look like and how its policies would be different? There are two problems. One is fundamental, and the other, and the other is personal. The fundamental problem is that given, again, mainstream minorities, the right wing relies on the ultra-orthodox to keep its majority. The left wing so far, with, with one exception of the Rabin government, refrained from reaching out to the Arab voters and, and tried to make them, to turn them into part of the bloc. So they could rely on, 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 the, Arab, on the Arab members of Knesset to, to uh, tacitly support left wing governments. But still the barrier uh, uh, to, to actually integrate them into a coalition has proved too strong. Now, the voter turnout of the ultra-Orthodox is, I don't know, it's 90% or so, whatever. And the voter turnout of the Arab votes, voters in Israeli national elections is about 55%. So you have an untapped resource of voters there. And the Arab voters in, in recent years refrained from voting for Zionist parties. So their, rep their representation of the Arab parties in the Knesset has actually grown, but it's still below its potential. And to, in order to, to return to power seriously, the left would have to reach out to the Arab community. And it's a very, very, very difficult and painful process for the left, not least uh, exemplified by Ari Lapid when he was asked why do you join Netan Why did you recommend Netanyahu to the president to be in, in Israel? The, the, the national election is kind of you elect an electoral college, and then the party representatives have to go to the president to recommend a prime minister, one of them, because no one won a major, ever won a majority. So Lapid recommended Netanyahu, and he was asked, "Why do you recommend Netanyahu? Why don't you think of an alternative coalition without Netanyahu or with Netanyahu as second, second in yeah. command?" And he said, I'm not going to join the Zobis. Hanin Zobi is the, the face of, of uh, Palestinian nationalism in the Israeli Knesset. I'm not going to join the Zobis. Now, if, if Lapid is the mainstream and he treats, and he calls the Arab members of Knesset, he's equals the Zobis, then there's a very long way to go for the center left to break that taboo. But if it wants to survive, it would have to do it at some point in the future. But that's it for the longer term. For the shorter term, there's a leadership problem. There is no leader in the left or the center left that appears to be able to stand up to Netanyahu and to offer an alternative. And therefore, and therefore as long as the left lacks a leader, how can, how can the right be replaced? Yeah. And the only one now challenging Netanyahu in this, or, or, or growing to challenge Netanyahu in, in, in the Israeli political scene is Lieberman, his partner. Oh, God. <laughs> right.